Well, good morning, Living Springs. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Can we rise to our feet and join in worship today?
I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes over the rise death is defeated the king is alive well I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Amen. Father, we 
we give you glory this morning, Lord. We're so grateful for your presence, Father. We thank you for the gift of mothers. Without them, Lord Father, I don't know what we'd be doing. This morning, Lord Father, we ask you just to come into this place, Lord. We ask you to dwell with us, to engage with us, Lord Father. We thank you for the safe place we have, Lord, to cast our burdens and cares upon you. the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Jesus, you are worthy. Let's whisper those words together. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Lord, we rejoice in who you are. You are good, and you are awesome. We're going to worship together with the words of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, all my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's give to the Lord an offering of thanks and praise to him. Let's give him praise. Lift it up, say, you are worthy, Lord. We worship you in this place. We honor you, King Jesus. And now just in quiet, personalize that. Say, Lord, I praise you for. Just in quiet, not out loud. Lord, I praise you for. I remember you for. Thank you for. Tell him why you love him. Listen to these words. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be forgiven and that times of refreshing may come to you. Repentance is the doorway to a changed life. Take a moment in silent confession. What do you need to give to Jesus that day? Lord, forgive me for it. Thank you for your word that reminds us as far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our transgressions from us, that you cleanse us, that you wash us, that you renew us, that you make us whole and holy. And so we receive your washing today. And Lord, we pray for ourselves and others today according to your will. Why don't you take a moment to think about someone who may, in a special way today, need to experience the presence of the Lord. I want to ask you to pray for that dear one. Lord, today we remember those who are sick. We remember those who are impoverished. We remember those who are war-torn and broken, who are displaced, Lord, those millions of people in our world. I think I read that there was 83 million displaced persons in our world right now who have lost home, separating from family. Lord, we pray for those whose hearts are heavy. And Lord, we thank you for those whose hearts are lifted today. And God, in the midst of it, in the midst of trials, challenges, God, we're grateful that you are good all the time. That you are gracious, that you are kind. And Lord, I thank you that in you we find life. And so, Lord, even today, even in this place, even this morning, right now, we yield ourselves to you. Open your hands to the Lord just for a moment. Lord, we open our hands to you and our hearts to you. Meet us in this place. Minister to us. Lift us. Lift us above. Lord, give us your life and your presence and your joy. 
And now let's again lift up praise. Put your hands together and give him praise. God, we thank you for this time of prayer and worship. And we offer ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. Take a moment to move around and welcome someone. Make sure they know that they're welcomed and blessed. Make sure you do that. One, two, three. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Living Springs today. And isn't it great to see the sun? Isn't it glorious to know that with the long winter is coming to an end and that spring and summer are coming? So that's, that's a joy. Uh, so welcome, everybody. We have some VIPs among us uh, today. Anybody know who that might be? Th thank you. Moms. One person knew that. It's Mother's Day. Happy uh, uh, Mother's Day to mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers. So we're going to do a little shout-out now. We're going to be honoring our moms a little later in a special way. But right now we're giving a shout-out. We're saying, Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mom, on three. Got it? Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mom, on three, like you mean it. All right? Ready? One, two, three. Happy Mother's Day. We love you moms. Amen. Let's, let's give them joy. We love you. All right. So welcome mothers and every one of you. It's a joy to worship with you. You know, you know what the Word of God says? I hope you come with expectancy today because the Word says wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. There's a multiplied presence of the Lord when we come to gather together and worship him. And that is a joy that we get to worship him today together. And I hope you come expectant, hearts wide open to receive all that he has because the Lord's going to meet us today. So welcome everyone. It's a joy to worship with you. I got a couple of quick things to pass along. There are some welcome cards out if you could grab those. And I don't know if I, if I uh, released the children. If, if, you're, if you're a young person, you can be released to, to, um, to children's uh, uh, Sunday school. Uh, and the rest, I want to invite you to take out those welcome cards, fill those out, beautify them with your name and information. We want to know how we can pray for you or bless you. If there's a need, a prayer request or a praise, let us know. We want to pray for you in this coming week. And you can place that in the offering baskets when they're passed. Hang on to your cards if you are a first-time guest today. You can bring those cards to the Welcome Center, and they have a very nice gift for you, so make sure you do that, and a special shout-out and welcome to you, and so do that. A couple quick things to pass along. Uh, first of all, May 29, uh, we have the Garden Keepers are going to welcome you to get your hands a little dirty. We're going to be beautifying our church property here, uh, particularly the north side, the, the circle there. We're going to be planting flowers and stuff. Uh, that, that's the technical word for it. 
flowers and stuff or and such. So um, if you're one of those that likes to get dirty and loves to help out, uh, this is for you. Uh, it's the 21st of May. That's not this Saturday, the following Saturday. Uh, th uh, and uh, that will be, I think it's at 9 a.m. Is that right? If you can circle the letter B, 9 a.m. is correct. All right, 9 a.m. Circle letter B for beautify if you'd be willing to help with that. And there may even be some treats. So think, uh, consider that. We're going to beautify this place. Then I also want you to know that um, we are always looking for ways to bless our community and beyond. And so there's a number of ways. This first way can literally save a life. Uh, we are partnering with a, a number of area churches, and we are actually going to be hosting a community blood drive. There is a real need in our area for a blood drive, and you can see the dates there, May 24 and 27. I believe that's a Tuesday and Thursday, or Friday, sorry. And uh, it says it right there, duh. Okay, Tuesday, Friday. Um, and actually, I think the, the Friday one, you get a free $10 gift card, too, so that's kind of nice. But... Um, we are welcoming you to uh, donate at that time, and that's a great way to bless our community. And uh, then we, I have an amazing young leader, Miss Suzanne. Come on up here. Come on down. You get to spin the wheel or something. I don't know. No, no wheels to spin. Come on up. And she's going to be, uh, she's an amazing young leader here at Living Springs, and she's going to tell us some ways that we can uh, make a difference. So, Thank you. Good morning, Living Springs. So um, my name is Suzanne Bush, and in December of 2020, I started a nonprofit called Made in the Image, um, which is really focused around ending homelessness in Chicago. And so um, in the interim, while I'm working on that larger goal, I also serve people where they are. Um, so I lead a team of people each month to go out and serve homeless around Chicago. I, I bring a mobile coat rack so people can pick out their own clothing. We supply toiletries, um, food, and clothing. And so... Um, I'm asking you guys for the month of May to partner with me and bring in any toiletries that you possibly can. There is a box outside of the um, sanctuary just to the right. Here's our beautiful picture <laughs> um, just to the right um, with a list of toiletries that I'm looking for. Um, preferably no toothpaste or toothbrushes because I have abundance of those. People are very passionate about dental health, so I have <laughs> so much of those. Um, but if you can, I mean, deodorant, um, the list goes on, band-aids, et cetera. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at madeintheimage.inc at gmail.com. You can scan that QR code right now. Um, permission to take out your phone during church. Um, but you can scan, scan that QR code now to go to my website as well um, or reach out to me if you see me around. So please help me in partnering um, so that we can serve homeless around Chicago. Thank you. Um, Let's pray for Suzanne in this ministry. Can we do that? Just extend a blessing. Yes, extend a hand. Let's pray. God, thank you for this burden that you've placed on my dear sister. And Lord, we don't want her to carry this on her own. Lord, we want to partner. And so we pray blessing on the work she's doing. We pray for those who are, find themselves without a home. And we're asking that this ministry would be a real blessing to those. And we pray uh, that there would be an end to homelessness and that we could be a part of that. And so we pray these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. All right. I like you, Suzanne. Very cool. One last thing, friends, uh, and then I'm going to uh, ask the ushers to come. Um, you may have noticed that Pastor Jason hasn't been here for a couple weeks, and let me tell you about that. Do you know how teachers have this glorious thing called summer break? Now, being married to a teacher, I know how, what a blessing that is for them. They really deserve that. And uh, you know how professors even get these things called uh, sabbaticals for six months to a year to write, read, reflect, rest. And, uh, you know, we, we pastor types uh, get to work all week and then every weekend and every major holiday. So you can imagine that at times, especially after a two years of kind of crazy, that uh, we can use some rest too. And so the, the uh, consistory has graciously given us several weeks, both of us, just to take for rest, reflection, uh, re recovery, um, and looking forward to the future. And so 
Pastor Jason will be back in two Sundays, and then you will miss my uh, funny-looking presence for several weeks as I'm going to be taking some time off. And so we want you to know we're not just going to Tahiti, but this is a time of, although that would be nice, uh, we're taking some time to rest and reflect and pray and write and read and all that good stuff. So we, we want to thank you and also ask for your prayers if that would be a, a good time for both Pastor Jason, who's gone now, and me in a couple weeks. Okay, amen? All right, um, come on up, uh, and let's, I'd like to ask if the ushers would come. I have asked the lovely Nicole, one of the ways that we get to partner, oh, it's back. <laughs> one of the ways that we get to uh, partner in mission is, well, I'll let uh, Nicole tell you. Good morning, Living Spring. Um, so you guys know that we have been building a relationship with uh, Mayfield, Kentucky, Midwestern Disaster Relief. Um, now we've been three times, and tomorrow, today is Sunday, right? <laughs> tomorrow morning, half of our team will leave out at 7 a.m. Um, these are students who have moved out of their dorms, packed all their stuff in their cars, and they're not going home just yet. We get to go back to uh, Mayfield and Paducah, where we're partnering with a number of folks uh, because of the devastation from the tornado and hurricane there. Um, if you guys could pray with us, uh, Living Springs, uh, the deacons, so many of you have graciously offered us funds. Those funds support students going and imagining what it would look like to build internships, sustainable relationships, and that's towards Kentucky. But we're also imagining bringing that type of mission back to our part of town. That is to remobilize us into mission right, get us busy again uh, after COVID to what does it mean to take care of your neighbor. Um, I'd like to thank the church so much for all your donations. Can I make a public service announcement? If you have a Ring Doorbell app, can you silence the <laughs> doorbell app? <laughs> you guys can laugh. Thank you so much for your support. And I'd ask that you not just pray for us. We we go Monday, the team will be there Monday through Sunday. I'll go for a few days. July, one of my team members, my colleagues will spend an entire month there just devising a plan. And I want you to know that Axe Ministries is the exact same build and makeup as our garage. That's where all this beautiful stuff is happening out of. So please pray with us, keep us in your prayers and thoughts, and thank you for your support. All right, we get to partner with these folks, and let's pray together for that, too. Let's, again, extend our hand. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that Nicole and these uh, students have to serve and to make a difference. And I pray, God, that not only would they make a difference there at this time, but would you, uh, Lord, begin to put dreams and visions into their hearts about giving their lives away in mission and ministry and, Lord, I pray that you build good relationships and that there would be uh, just a beautiful time had by all. And we're praying for safety and travel and blessing, that you bless them and, and use them to make a difference. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this time now to give and, to, and the opportunity to serve through our gifts that will bless both people here in this community and to the ends of the earth. And we're grateful for this time to give in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning. Happy Mother's Day. We are uh, excited to um, have the opportunity to bless moms even here this morning. Um, now, I'm excited to get to share and to give the word here this morning, but I have a very interesting task because most of you all know that we are in the middle of a series going through the biblical timeline from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and we are right now in the middle of the Old Testament and New Testament talking about the 400 years of silence, and yet today is Mother's Day, and I want to give a message that would be encouraging to mothers. So I have the task of putting together the 400 years of silence with a Mother's Day encouragement. So trying to make that work is a little bit difficult, but I tell you that the key will be transitions, such as this one. As I said, 400 years of silence is a wonderful, you know, is a crazy thing in the biblical story. You know who else likes silence? Moms. <laughs> I know my mom could have used some more silence. She, uh, I remember hearing this story growing up that she got so annoyed of me and my sisters saying, Mom, 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 all the time. And then eventually the parakeet learned one word, which was mom. And the parakeet joined in calling for mom. <laughs> she just wanted to go crazy. Well, I have the perfect message uh, regarding the 400 years of silence that I think will be a blessing to our mothers. And so it begins. Just kidding. <laughs> I am hopeful this morning that uh, I can give a message that will be a blessing to us, an encouragement that does the story and, and the biblical timeline justice, but also encourages mothers' hearts here this morning. So if you would, just pray with me and let's ask God to come and speak to us however he wants. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share here this morning. And God, I thank you for the many hearts that are in this room and God, how you want to encounter every person here. God, from young mothers to old mothers to not mothers to husbands to kids, God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have a word for every one of us. And so I pray this morning, God, that you would come and speak to us, you would do this kind thing, and reveal your nearness to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start with that 400 years of silence. Now, here's the deal. Um, the 400 years of silence isn't actually mentioned in Scripture. It is just a fact of something that happens, okay? It is, it is the space between the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. It was that God was speaking all along the way, and then suddenly, for 400 years, it appears that there was nothing being said. They were left with prophecies that were not yet fulfilled, and 400 years of quiet. Now, I want to tell us a little bit about that time. Um, you know, I, I know not many people would be excited about a history lesson on Mother's Day, so I promise not to dive in too deep, but also because I'm not an expert in this particular area either, but I've done some research and I hope um, could help give us a picture uh, and then transition us into what God has to say to us here this morning. So first off, the history of the 400 years of silence is important to note where Israel is on the map. Now, if you look, by this time, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what the land was like in those days so we get a good understanding. First off, if you look, up to the north, we have all kinds of countries. And up to the south, we have all kinds of countries. Or down to the south, we have all kinds of countries. And then to the right, we have desert. Now, here's the deal. If a king got angry, a king of the north got angry with a king of the south, or a king of the south get angry with a king of the north, where do you think they're going to march through? They're going to march right through Israel. And when, when there were wars that were happening and there were kings in, in conflict, they didn't just, you know, they, they weren't just going to parade through Israel like, hey, we're on our way to go fight this king. See y'all. Like, no, they took over that too. So in this time frame of Israel's past, what happened was the Assyrians came in and they decided to come and take out the northern kingdom. They were probably going to take out the southern kingdom too. But before they finished taking off uh, or getting to the southern kingdom, what happened was they get word that they're getting attacked back home and they find out the Babylonians are attacking and they get taken out by the Babylonians. 
but they did take out the northern kingdom beforehand. So Israel's northern kingdom taken out by the Assyrians. The Babylonians came in and took over, and they were running things now. Now, after that, now the, uh, the Babylonians, they're going to go ahead and come down, and they take out the southern kingdom. So now Israel is completely owned by the Babylonians. Well, eventually the Persians come in. And the Persians come in, and they wipe out the Babylonians, and they take over the land. Now, the thing about the Persians was they, they weren't, okay, uh, they, were, they were bad, but let's, let's talk about this. The Persians kind of had a little bit of a different attitude towards Israel at the time. They were kind of in the everybody's right religion club. So they were like, you know, Jews, you guys could worship uh, your God if it gets us some extra points. Because basically the Persians were like, hey, we want points with every god. So whoever you are, you worship your god, you worship your god, I'll, we'll take the points. God, look, look what we did. And it's in the midst of that that King Cyrus comes forth in Persia. And I've talked about this message before where King Cyrus took up a tax and paid for the Jews to go and rebuild their temple. It's the story in Zechariah where Zerubbabel comes forth and he shouts to the temple, uh, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Right. And so that's underneath the Persian lead. But pretty soon the Greeks would come in with all of their foreign gods and they would wipe out the Persians. Now, here's the crazy thing about the Greeks. The Greeks were not all that kind to the Jews. They were not all that kind to Israel. In fact, we hear of many stories of martyrdom of people. I mean, I was going through some of the history of the Greeks ruling and reigning in that area, and they were getting limbs severed uh, for not bowing their knee to the Greek gods. They were getting put on torture racks. They were getting killed and abused for not bowing the knee to the Greek gods. So it wasn't an easy time, and it was in that time that the 400 years of silence started. Now, what I want to do is I want to give us the last words of the Old Testament so you understand where they were right in the midst of that time, all right? So if you can, or uh, it'll be up here, Malachi uh, 4, verse 5 and 6, it says this, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Now, that is the word that ends the Old Testament. What's interesting, in other versions of the scripture, you'll see that word total destruction replaced with the word curse. And so there's a prophecy given. God's going to do this thing where the hearts of the parents turn towards the children and the children to the parents, or else he's going to come and strike the land with the curse. Now, if you are Israel, alive in this day, God has been quiet since that word, and now you've been kicked around by all these countries, people are getting tortured and killed for believing and not bowing their knee to the Greek gods, what do you assume is the reason for that silence? You're going to assume that you're under the curse. You're going to assume that you're in the midst of that curse. And I think that was very easy for, for them to have gone through it. I mean, uh, to, to uh, at least jump to that conclusion. It certainly must have felt like a curse. But eventually the word would come to pass. <clears throat> and here's the deal. Right at that time, in the middle of those 400 years, maybe a little bit further on, the big machine of a empire would arise to wipe out the Greeks. Does anybody know who that was? Extra credit. The Romans. The Romans came in. And now here's what's interesting, and I, I want us to see here, because it really was the perfect setup by God in many ways. The Roman Empire comes in and wipes out the Greeks, but they go through and wipe out just about everybody. All of that colored area becomes the Roman Empire. Okay? And here's the deal. Here's why it matters. Because in just a little while, all of the prophecies spoken will come to pass. And a gospel message will have to be carried to the nations. Here's the deal. That set up things perfectly for the gospel message to spread all underneath in, without having to leave the empire you were under. Does that make sense? And so it was a perfect timing by God to come and fulfill the prophecies. But what else is Rome known for? Do you know? Their roads, right? All roads lead to Rome. 
The whole point was they were really great at building roads, which also helped to spread the gospel one day. But here we are in the midst of that. Rome comes in. You know, they're not too friendly either, but they're kind of like, hey, Israel, you pay your taxes. You could do what you want. Um, and that was kind of, kind of the, the understanding that they had. But here's the deal. They have been underneath this silence for 400 years. They've been in pain. They've been in sorrow. They've been in suffering. I guess what I want us to see is that this was not an easy time for the Jews. This was not an easy time at all. There's never been a people group that's been so displaced again and again and again and again, like a beach ball being thrown back and forth uh, amongst the highest bidder, amongst the, the, the one with the most violence and, you know, everything else. So here we are in the midst of that kind of pain and that kind of struggle, and on top of that, God goes silent. I don't know if you've ever felt that in your life, but you're in the midst of struggle, and it feels like God went silent. But could you imagine if he really did for 400 years? It was not easy. But praise God, at the end of that 400 years, we see in Luke 117, the prophecy fulfilled in the midst of the Roman Empire. It says this, and he will go before the Lord. Now, this was a prof prophecy given to Zechariah about his son, John. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist would come, and he would fulfill the prophecy. He would come and fill that prophecy 400 years later and turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the children to the parents. It was great news. It was great news. Galatians 4, 5 says this. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. See, I love this scripture because it says this little line at the beginning. But when the set time had fully come. When I think of the set time, I think of uh, setting a timer on an oven, right? That it's cooking whatever's in it, and eventually it's going to buzz because the time is ready, the food is up, right? It's not so nice for whatever's cooking in the oven, but it's going to be nice for us who's going to enjoy it. In the same way, the pressure that creates diamonds, the, the, the heat that produces good food, the pressures in this world create character in us. And so in the same way, there was an appointed time that there would be silence, that when the time had come to its fulfillment, then the answer to the prophecies would come. Then would come John the Baptist, and game on, and then the Messiah. And this is good news. It, it was about preparing the people. But what would God's word be? You know, he, he spoke through the prophets in Malachi. He spoke throughout all the prophets, throughout all the ages. But what would his word be when he finally breaks the silence and he speaks for the first time in 400 years? What would his word be? I mean, you could imagine if you were in a scenario like that and this has been your history, right? If you were a Jew in that day and you saw the rise of this kind of violence, the gladiators had come forth, right? The violence as entertainment has come forth. There's been war after war, people killed for not bowing to God. What do you think God might say after 400 years of that? Many of us would assume, we would, you know, if I were God, this is what I would say. I would say, violence needs to end. I would say, people of God, thank you for being faithful to me even unto death. We're thinking of all of those things. But you know what God's actual words were? They're recorded in Scripture. It was Matthew 3.17 at Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The first words spoken by God after the 400 years of silence. This is my beloved son, Jesus, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, you might feel like that can't be the answer. How would that be the answer? Ultimately, we all say Jesus is the answer, but in the midst of our sorrow, in the midst of pain, it doesn't always feel like he is, right? But here's the deal. He was. He was the answer. Jesus was the one who was going to come make all things right, all things beautiful, just in time. And the point was that God was making was look to my son, Jesus. He is the answer for all of the questions you have, all of the sorrow you have throughout all mankind. He is the answer. 
Now here's the transition. Moms, how many of you feel like you have a promise that's given at the birth of your child? And you feel like there's dreams and you're just filled, your heart is filled with dreams for your children. You're so excited. I can't wait to give birth to this child. I can't wait and they're there. And then suddenly, the, the time frame between the prophecy and the fulfillment of that prophecy seems more like hell in between. <laughs> I know it. I know so many, struggle, uh, so many mothers struggle with the craziness of their house overrun by inmates. I mean children. <laughs> I've seen moms on Facebook lamenting and actually going through very physical pain over the, the failures of, of the struggles and the, the issues of their children. I've seen them struggle. Now, you know, it's, it's no surprise to any of you I'm not a mom. But I am a son, and I know what my mom went through to a certain degree, and I know what Jesus, I, I know the heart longing of Jesus for moms who are struggling. I've seen moms weary and wanting to give up. I've seen their posts on Facebook. I know of moms who just want to get together with their friends if they could just make sure their babysitter's available and could put some pocket cash in their pocket. I know that it feels alone. It feels lonely. And there's a struggle. And it's not easy. So many of you were so excited when you gave birth to your children. But the in-between has turned more into like the upside down from Stranger Things. It's like, I thought it was going to look this way and it just looks completely different. <laughs> I thought, I thought it was going to look like on those HGTV shows when the mom is sitting there having a picnic outside and all the children are wearing whites and they're all eating a nice picnic dinner with that fancy lemonade thing all filled up that somebody made and everybody's clean and everybody's happy. And you all are like, my kids don't look like that. I don't look like that. My house doesn't look like that. I know it's a struggle. But I believe that the same answer that God gave to the people of God is the same answer he would give to mothers. This is my beloved son, Jesus, in whom I'm well pleased. Look at Jesus. He is the answer, and he will make a way. I want us to look in the book of Hebrews, 12 verse 1. And this is where our word for mothers is coming from today. It says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to break this verse down for us because I want us to, to see, I believe, a message that God would give to every one of us here this morning. To young moms, to old moms, to dads, to husbands, to single dudes, to single ladies, all the single ladies. I believe there's a word for us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great, a great cloud of witness, let, let us throw off everything that hinders. I believe that there is so much that hinders us in the season of despair. The enemy comes in and he will whisper all kinds of things to your heart in those seasons. Am I right or wrong? The enemy comes in and will say, you're failing as a parent. Look at this house. It's a sty and it's been a sty for three years. The enemy, the enemy will come in and they'll be like, you, you don't measure up to anybody else. The enemy comes in and says all these awful things. And it says, let us throw off everything that hinders. I believe first, one of the number one things that hinders is lies from the enemy. 
lies from the enemy that come in and that we just have to break agreement with. I refuse to buy what the enemy's saying, even if it sounds somewhat true. I heard somebody say this, don't believe the devil even when he tells the truth. Because, the, cause, you know, it is true, my house does look like a sty. It just isn't what the Lord is saying, isn't going, well, you're hopeless because of it. That's what the enemy's saying. And so we have to throw off all of the lies that come on us in the seasons of despair. I believe Israel had to do the same thing in that 400 years of silence. What do you think God was whispering to them? You are cursed. God left you. You're on your own. Those prophecies are null and void. None of it's going to happen. You have to understand, for four generations of people, there's nothing from God. They, they have to believe that it's hopeless. But let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. What's the sin? I would say this. I would say we run to other pleasures when we are in the midst of despair. Anything to fulfill, right? We try to find something else because we're, we're not feeling good about this or not feeling good about that. And we haven't turned to Jesus, so we just run to sin. That'll make me feel a little bit better. I'll just go in the, I'll, I'll run away from my kids and I'll go get a drink somewhere. I'll, I'll just do this or do that, or I'll, I'll have a blow up and, you know, whatever it else it is. We're to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And it says this, and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, that word perseverance is so important. Because the reality is that that word persevere implies that there's going to be problems along the way. That means God's already accounted for the obstacles on, on your race. He already knows. And we are to persevere. We are to keep moving forward. We are to keep pushing through. Even when we want to give up. That is the deal. It says we are to persevere for the race marked out for us. Now, I think this one's important, moms. Each of our races are different. Each of our races are different. Our race doesn't look like anybody else's race. I know that a lot of us want to look at the other mom down the street and be like, well, it looks like she's got everything all together, but I sure don't. Each of your races are different. I know such a variety of moms. I know moms who have their house full of people and just want them all to get out. I know moms who have an empty nest and are feeling lonely, right? Everybody's race is different. But we're to run our race, our race. There's this line in the Song of Solomon I always love. It, it says, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. The reality is we're all going to a place where we have to go our own way with God through our race. Each one of us. And so I'm telling you, we have to quit comparing ourselves to other people. God doesn't say, look to your right and left and how your neighbors are doing it, and then you should do likewise. He says, look at me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. We need to have our eyes locked on him. And he is the perfecter of faith. I love that word perfecter because it speaks of a process, right? Right? It speaks of a process of, of what we need to do and what we need to go through, that timer on the oven that is set to bring forth character. It's going to take something. It's, it's, called, it's called the process of sanctification, right, where we have to work and we go through trials, but God brings forth things in our hearts. It goes on. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. I remember hearing this when I was a kid, and we're like, that doesn't make any sense. For the joy, Jesus went to the cross? Like, I was like, I remember him in the garden, right? And wasn't he, like, kind of freaking out a little bit? <laughs> For the joy set before him? Well, here's the deal. The point is, is that there was something on the other side that would be worth it. That is something we need to remember in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our sorrow, that it's going to be worth it all. Yes, it feels like a mess right now. Yes, your kids are dirty and gross. Yes, it feels like nothing's happening, but it's going to be worth it because something is being produced in the process that will help you on the flip side. Jesus went to the cross not because the cross was going to feel nice like a day at the spa. He endured the pain and the shame of the cross because he saw something on the other side, which was relationship with you and me. 
and he wanted to get connected with us at a deep level. Praise God. And then it says this, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That growing weary and losing heart, that's not something that happens overnight, is it? Growing weary is something that goes on for a long period of time. Losing heart is something that happens in the slow drift of pain and sorrow and struggle. If many of us were uh, honest, we've gone through seasons of the slow drift and feeling weary. We've gone through the struggle. I want to encourage us. God wants us to fix our eyes on him so that we will not grow weary. That is the key to look at the beloved son, Jesus. Years ago, I've shared this story before, and I'm going to share it again, and I don't apologize if you've heard it five times. It inspires me every time I share it, and so I'm going to share it again, and I hope that it will encourage somebody else here. Years ago, I was doing my internship at the International House of Prayer, and there was uh, many different leaders uh, there and speakers and preachers, and there was a woman um, named Jennifer Roberts who uh, didn't get to speak much because she was uh, raising up three kids at home at the time. And uh, so she wasn't, got, didn't get to be in the prayer room a lot. Now, the prayer room is a 24-hour-a-day place where there's worship and prayer for years. And so a lot of the leaders would get plenty of time to spend in the prayer room and to preach and to share and to lead in different prayer meetings. But she felt like she was in the prison of her home. How many moms have felt like their home has been a prison before? Honestly. Yeah. She felt like she was in the prison of home. And she's watching everybody else seemingly enjoy their time and step out and do great things for God while she had to pick Cheerios out of her kid's nose. And so she was getting discouraged and was sitting there and going, God, I'm not doing anything for the kingdom. Like when she heard about like Mission Sunday and all these things God was doing, she's like, I got these kids at home. I'm cleaning up Cheerios and trying not to step on Legos. That is what I offer to the kingdom. This, there's got to be more. And she's struggling and struggling and struggling. And finally, one day, God gives her a dream. And she shared this with our, our community. In the dream, she looked down, and she saw that she was on a track. And at the end of the track was Jesus. She saw that to her right and left were many of the, her friends, other fellow ministers, preachers, and, and other folks And they were all ready at the beginning of this race. And they knew that the race was going to start soon. And Jesus was at the end. And the goal was to run to Jesus. She looks down at herself. You know, everybody else, they have, they have like good running gear on. They got their jogger suits. They're, they're ready to go. They're all set and ready for the gunshot to go off to take off running. But she looks down at herself. And she's got a diaper bag. She's got a stroller. She's got a kid on her hip. And a baby in her hands. And she's like, okay, I don't know how this is going to go. Boom, the gunshot goes off. And they start running. Well, she's hobbling. She's got this kid and this diaper bag and this stroller. She's kicking the stroller ahead, trying to pull her other kid behind. There's Legos all over her her track. She's like, she's, she's running. And Jesus keeps saying, look at me. Look at me. And, and she's got, God, I can't. I'm not going to win. She keeps on shouting, I'm not going to win. And Jesus says, it's not about the person on your right or left. You keep looking at me. If you don't quit, you win. If you don't quit, you win. Just keep moving. See, it's not about how quick you run. Or whether or not you're going to win that race compared to the people next to you, right? It's go your way, run your race. For her, it didn't look like a nice easy stride along the way. It looked like tripping over Legos. But you know what? She was winning because she was running after Jesus. I heard somebody say these at Rock the Nations all those years ago. They said, you know what? If you can't run, walk. And if you can't walk, crawl. And if you can't crawl, just roll your way down. But just keep moving. Keep running to Jesus. Listen, moms who are going through the ringer, if you don't quit, you win. I don't want to underestimate your struggle. 
I know the struggle is real. I know some of you don't know what to do with your children. I know some of you don't know what to do with the pain that you're underneath. And I want to tell you, I can't relate because I'm not a mom, but I can say this. I know that Jesus is the answer. This is his beloved son in whom he's well pleased. Fix your eyes on Jesus and persevere. Just don't give up. Don't give in. If you don't quit, you win. Even when it feels like nothing's going to happen, fix your eyes on Jesus. You know that, that phrase, fix your eyes on Jesus, makes me think there's another line in Song of Solomon that has always blessed me. God compares his bride to a dove. He says, you have dove's eyes. Do you know why, why he chooses dove's eyes? It's not because it just sounds romantic and poetic. The reason dove's eyes are chosen is because doves are one of the birds that have no peripheral vision. It's why when you're driving and those morning doves are on the road, sometimes you hear them clink underneath your car. Because <laughs> they didn't see the car coming until you're over them. They have, they have no peripheral vision. They don't see anything on their left or on their right. They only look forward. But Jesus says, I want you to have dove's eyes, church. I want you to have eyes that are locked on me, that aren't confused about what's going on on the right and the left. I want your eyes fixed on me, dove's eyes locked on me. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but Jesus is still your answer. Jesus, you, you go, well, it doesn't clean the house. It's not going to clean my kids up. No, but it's going to settle your soul. It's going to bring encouragement to you. I feel like in the same way Israel, you know, had to be there in those 400 years of silence. It's not, it doesn't look like it's getting any better. I don't really know if this is going to fix. God, your words are, this is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased. What about all the pain I went through? I promise you, Jesus is still that answer. Jesus is still that answer. I think we have these stories in Scripture. I think this chunk of 400 years might be here to remind us that not all storms last forever. To remind us that in every life there are thousands of seasons. And this season might be a little bit rough. But the next season would be better. And if this season's really great, the next season might get rough again. But God is still faithful. And it's still worth keeping your eyes fixed on him. I believe stories like this are in scripture for us to know that we need to encourage one another. It says in Hebrew, it's in all the more as you see the day approaching. Encourage one another. And consider how you may spur on one another towards love and good deeds. That we would be people who would encourage. And ultimately, we would be people who pray for each other. I'm sad that often in the church, we can have those brief conversations like, how are you? Fine, things are rough. Okay. But we don't really take the time to pray for each other. There are people in this room who need our prayers. There are people today who might have things unlocked if the person next to them prays for them. So many people want to think it's the preacher who can pray for the deliverance. But your answer might be in the person right next to you. I want to pray for group, two groups of people this morning. I want to first ask, if you are a mom, I don't care what age, young, old, and I should say young, seasoned, <laughs> They put me in charge once of like uh, this, uh, the, this uh, senior appreciation Sunday, and I forgot the word senior, and I said elderly. <laughs> like, this is awful. <laughs> but I want to ask moms to go ahead and stand right where you're at. I want to pray for moms this morning. Now, if, you, if it's your mom who's by you or not your mom, your wife, or if there's a mom near you, because th there's plenty of moms here who don't have their kids with them, I want you just to extend a hand. If you're right next to them, place a hand on them. Family first, for sure. If you're a family member, get around your moms. I want to pray for mothers here this morning. And I want to pray that God would encourage you. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for these moms in this room. God, I know we have younger moms and seasoned moms here, but... I pray this morning that you would bless our mothers. God, we pray, oh God, that you would encourage their hearts this morning with your words. God, we know that their sacrifice has not been in vain. 
And God, that you know every tear they have cried on behalf of their children and their families. Lord, there are many kids who have come to the faith years later because of a grandmother's prayers. Lord, would you let these moms see the fruit of their labor. Let them know that you are with them. And that you, oh God, have carried their burdens and are carrying their burdens even today. Lord, encourage, strengthen, and give joy to our moms in this room. And even those who are not in this room, God, we pray for them as well. God, strengthen and encourage them. Fill them with hope. Strengthen them for the tasks yet ahead. And help them, oh God, to receive every bit of love on this day. God, would you help mothers to run their race and not lose sight of you. Help them to fix their eyes on Jesus in the midst of the storm. God, we pray even this morning that you would do more than what some little preacher's words can do, that you would inspire and encourage moms in the midst of their storm, that you aren't waiting for the house to get clean to show up. You are there in the midst of the messy house. So that you're not waiting for everything to get shiny and perfect on H, like on HGTV. God, that you are there in the midst loving and cheering these moms on on their race. God, we pray for our mothers. Encourage them this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to invite everybody to stand. I want to pray for everybody else because I know, as I said, I'm not a mom, but all those years ago, that story that Jennifer told struck me just the same because I have a race to run and there are hurdles in my races there's hurdles along my my path but I need to run my race and I need to fix my eyes on Jesus and so I want to pray for all of us this morning so pray with me Lord this morning we heard about the 400 years of silence God before you broke in with that silence with this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased God, let us run our race even if we feel weak. Help us, oh God, to keep our eyes on you and not on the storms all around us. God, keep us from comparing ourselves to the other runners on our left and on our right. God, we want to be steady and faithful until the end. God, would you help your sons and daughters this morning and bless us with a steady heart. God, with a locked gaze like the dove's eyes. God, we love you, Jesus. Now, O Lord, would you bless and fill each person here this morning with joy, hope, and strength for all that is to come. I pray your blessing now over this congregation in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless all of you. Have a happy Mother's Day. If any of you would like prayer, we'll have prayer folks up front. God bless you.